few times through my life, I've heard about this reality of the love and value and affection and the significance of that in young children and adolescents as they grow and mature in life. And both the unwillingness or maybe unable uh, inability to provide that from caretakers really has this tremendous impact on young lives and on adolescents as they grow up. And, and that lack of affection, lack of love, lack of care can result in lots of things. It can result in uh, aversion to risk or trying new things. It can, it can result in personality disorders. It can result in, in fear or anxiety about the future, about identity issues. And really, it just, it just kind of uh, encapsulates and in, in, in models for us this impact of love and care. And maybe, maybe you've experienced that in, in your own life. Maybe you've experienced the impact of, of love and care and affection as you grew up in a, in a positive way or, or maybe in a negative way where there was an absence there. But I was just really struck by that reality. Like, man, love and, and affection and care has so much impact, even down to the physiological way we grow and mature and develop as human beings. And it got me thinking about a little bit um, how that, that same reality, that same truth might be represented, might be um, um, symbolized even in our spiritual lives, in our spiritual development. If you think about uh, a journey with Jesus and faith in Jesus as, as almost like a childhood in adolescence and a teenage years in college, you, like how that, how that same movement happens uh, both in our age and in our life circumstance, that same movement and trajectory and growth happens with, with life with Jesus. And I wonder if some of the, the underdevelopedness or the underdeveloped things in our lives actually stems from, just like in, in children and adolescents experiencing a lack of love, I wonder if that same thing can be true for us. If, if things are underdeveloped, if, if character things, if maybe certain fears or mindsets are a result, stem from a lack of love. And here's the thing, if, if you believe in God today, if you believe that God is good, that he is never changing, that he is all powerful, then you believe that his love towards us and his care towards us never changes, right? It's always, it's always being poured out, it's always being extended to us. So unlike the, the reality in adolescents and children, it's not a giving issue to us, it's a receiving issue on our part. If we don't experience the love of God, the care of God, the, the tenderness of God and the kindness of God, just like a, a child would to a parent, it's not necessarily his fault or his responsibility. Maybe the issue is more with how we receive it, how we, how we interpret it at. And I want to I wanna explore that with you today. I want to look at that with you today. Because, because just like in children and young lives, how the impact and the care of, of adults and, and authority figures is so significant. Just like with us, as we grow, as we develop, as we journey through life, our ability to receive love, to receive care, to receive the goodness and the kindness and the leading of God is so important. And, and let me just be really honest with you today. I don't want you to miss that. I don't want you to miss out on the goodness and the care and the love that God has for you. And I want to explore that today with you. I want to do it in a psalm. I want to do it at, in Psalm 36. And Psalm 36 is amazing. It has lots of different elements of it. But one of this, these elements is the reflection of the writer on the love of God. Now, this writer has experienced lots of different things in his life. He's experienced aban abandonment and betrayal. He's experienced fear and, and restlessness and worry and anxiety. He's, expe he's experienced people trying to, to kill him and take his life, people angry with him. Then he's experienced some really good things. He, he's, le he's led a nation. He's led a group of people. He's led an army. He's, he's led God's people in worship. He's been kind of a, a pastor role to, to God's people. And he's had all these ups and downs, but, but one thing that's true that he writes about is the, the constants, the steadiness, the faithfulness of the love and care of God. I want to look at it with you today. Psalm 36. Psalm 36. We're going to jump into verse 5. So a little bit through this psalm of Psalm 36. Let's read it together. It says, Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the skies. Your, your righteousness is like the highest mountains. Your justice like the great deep. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. How priceless is your unfailing love, O God. People take refuge 
in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from the river of delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. Continue your love. Continue your love to those who know you. Your righteousness to the upright in heart. I love this passage, right? There's, if you're a visual learner, if you're a visual person, there's lots of things triggering in your mind and, and firing off in your mind as I read that passage. I love that. Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness, your steadiness to the skies. Your, your righteousness is like the highest mountains, or some say like the mighty mountains, so big, unwavering, and strong. Your justice like the great deep, like the depths. If you're a visual learner at all, maybe just, maybe just look at this picture on the screen with me right now. Just look at this picture. And you, you almost have this, this idea of the writer looking off this mountain cliff, uh, this cliff overlooking a mountainscape and, and the, the horizon before them. And maybe just reflecting on the goodness and the power of God. Just, just on this cliff, just looking around and observing all the goodness of God. And just like the mountains, so his attributes are true about him. And all the realities of nature, maybe they're realities of God. One person says this, One can easily imagine that this, this psalm was written on some natural height from which the singer looked out on a far-stretching scene in which he saw symbols of truth concerning God. Note the sweep of vision, the heavens, the skies are clouds, the mountains, the great deep, the river, and over all, the light. I love that. I love that. God's so big, right? So powerful. So unchanging. So, so far beyond our own little capacity and little strength. So big. But I want to zero in on just one thing. And we, we talked about it a little bit earlier. The, the importance of the care and love of God. Three verses. Verse 5, he says this. Your love, Lord, it reaches to the heavens. Your love, your, your care, your concern is so great for us. It reaches to the heavens. How priceless, verse 7, is your unfailing love. How priceless. I can't replace it. I can't earn it. I can't manufacture it. Is your unfailing love, O oh God. Continue your love. Continue to, to reveal and release and extend your love to those who know you. Now, right, this idea of love. Um, it's not like the love I have for good coffee. Um, it's not like the love I have for, for guacamole um, from Chipotle. It's not like that kind of love. It's a love that's a care, that's a, the unselfish concern for us, that God has toward us. It's not just the way you like a good movie or love a good movie or a good time, but, but it's this unselfish care, unselfishly placing someone else above yourself. And God does that with us. With all the realities of who God is, with all the realities and the things that are happening in our world, God has an unselfish concern, unselfish, unselfishly places us before himself. It's a willful choice, an intentional decision. One writer says this, this kind of love that the writer is talking about, it's the love that gives. This kind of love is, is the love that gives. There's no taking involved. There's no selfishness involved. It is completely unselfish. It seeks the highest good for another, no matter what the cost. God's love, it reaches to the heavens. It's priceless. It's unfailing. And the writer says, that kind of love, continue that to us. We need that kind of love. Would you continue it to those who know you? And really the psalm gets at this, that God's primary disposition towards us is love. God's primary disposition, the way he is oriented towards us is in love. The way he sees you is through a lens of love. The way he thinks about you is through a lens of unselfish concern for your good. His primary disposition towards us is love. God's primary disposition towards you is love. His primary way of looking and thinking and feeling and acting towards you is love. For some of us, that's not the experience or the understanding we've experienced in our life, we've seemed to have in our lives. 
Maybe we've experienced a church or a person or a group. It's been really harmful in how we see God, how we see him as, as concerned about our life or how he thinks about our life. But God reveals through the scriptures, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, through, through all kinds of examples, his primary disposition towards you and us is love. And I'm really grateful for that today. I'm really grateful that God looks upon us through a lens of love. And it's not just huge, right? It's not just huge. Like the writer says, your, your love ex extends to the heavens. It reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness is like the skies. Your, your justice like the, the mountains and the deep and all these different things. And God's love is that big and he is that big. And God's love is, is big enough and powerful enough to extend to the whole creation, to extend to everything, the whole earth. And it's also close enough to extend to you. God's not just big. He's not just out there. He's not just in control of something. He's, he's concerned. He's full of care and love for you. And God wants to reveal that kind of love to you today. I'm confident of it. God wants to reveal, and, and, and every day, he, he wants to reveal his love to you. And maybe, maybe you've been walking with him for years and years. The same is true. God wants to reveal that kind of love for you today. He wants to reveal that love to you. He wants to reveal it through a couple of ways. And, and it's, not just, it's not just a head experience. It's not just an informational transaction. It's an experience of knowing that you know that you know that God is for you, he's concerned about your life, he has your best interests in mind. God's primary disposition is, is love towards you, and he wants to reveal that kind of love. And he does it a couple ways. He does it a couple ways. He reveals it through his creation. And some of, some of us are, are people, when you just get outside, you, you seem to slow things down, and the world makes a lot more sense, and you understand maybe life and, and God a little bit more. And I, I'm the same way. I love being in creation. And just, just think about the words of, of, of the psalm, right? Like, your love, Lord, it reaches to the heavens. Like, I look at the heavens and the skies. Your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the highest or the mightiest mountain. Your justice like the great deep. You, you preserve, Lord, both people and animals. Like, he's, he's saying God cares and he reveals his love through creation. He reveals his love, the ultimate revelation and the ultimate picture of God's love for you and for me and for us is Jesus, right? We look at John 13, John 3, sorry, John 3, 16, a verse that a lot of us know. And, and Jesus says about himself, for God, the, the Father sent me, the Son, so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave. God loved so much that he would give. Unselfishly, without a hidden agenda, God gave, God gave his one and only son so that whoever believes and trusts in him as Savior shall not perish but have eternal life. God reveals his love to us in Jesus. And Jesus is really love with, with skin on. Jesus is love in a person. We see that from his life. We see that in his death, Jesus unselfishly gave himself in death for you out of, out, of, out of a primary disposition of love, out of a desire to reveal his love to you. He reveals it through his son. And he reveals it through his Holy Spirit to those of us who follow Jesus. There's a verse in Romans that, that's really helpful. It says this, God's love has been poured into our hearts. God has actually extended and poured and revealed his love through the Holy Spirit, through the very presence of Jesus who has been given to us. God is, God's love has been poured out. It's been revealed through the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. Then, then another one is, God reveals his love to you. And if you've been walking with him for a long time, or maybe just even think about your life in general, Today, God reveals his love to you through your own story. Through your own story. If you think back some of the, the times in your life that God's been faithful to you, 
If you think about the ways provision, maybe financially or, or in other ways, has been given to you and extended towards you, you're like, man, I, I couldn't earn that. I, I, I couldn't manufacture. I couldn't make that happen on my own. That's God's love for you. I look back over these last 12 months, and, and my wife and I, Christy, talk about this often. It's, it's like, man, we look back over these last 10 or 12 months, and it's like there are countless ways that God has, has extended his love towards us. I mean, it, it doesn't make sense. It does, it, we haven't earned it. We haven't done anything to, to earn that kind of love or make that happen. It's just been purely his unselfish desire and his good desire for us to walk with him and, and for him to make a way for us. If you look back at your own story, there is evidence of God's love for you today. And maybe, maybe you would say, yeah, I don't know if I know Jesus I don't, know if I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm walking with him right now. God wants to reveal and start his story, his working of love in your life. God reveals his love to us. He wants to reveal it to you. God wants to reveal his love to you. His primary disposition of love. And I want to share a story. I want to share a story about someone who maybe we wouldn't even expect um, to experience the love of God and the power of God through his grace or his forgiveness. I want to share a story of a, a man, named, man named Kabi. And uh, I encountered this story through a book called Everybody Always. It was written by a guy named Bob Goff. And Bob has all these stories. And really the, the, the premise of the book is, is how do we love everybody always? I mean, pretty fitting. Like that's what God does for us. So how do, how do we do that for others? And he, he writes a story of, of this guy named Kabi, who's, who's a witch doctor in Uganda. He's a witch doctor, and, and part of the, 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 the um, role and duty of a witch doctor in a town is, is to perform sacrifices to, to pagan gods, to, to these gods who they believe have power and who they believe want to work in, in their life. And Kabi eventually was led to um, abduct this little boy named Charlie. And, and, he, and he attacked Charlie, and he actually mutilated him as an act of pagan worship, as an act of this witch doctor role and responsibility, and as a ceremony and an offering to one of these gods. Super tragic story. It's like, how would, how, how would anyone even get to that point? But, but Bob suddenly encounters Kavi, and I want you to hear on this story. I want to read it for us. There's a few pages out of the book, and just hear... Hear, the, hear the, all the change that happens in the story. Hear what, hear what happens. It's just wild. I, I know you're going to love it. It says this. this. This is Bob writing. He says, The minute he attacked Charlie, Kabi became my enemy. He wasn't a little evil. He was pure evil. It's easy to talk a good game about loving your enemies and, until you have one. I realized if I wanted big things to happen in my life, I'd need to take bigger steps and risk more than I had before. So I decided to visit Kabi in prison. Kabi had been sent to Lazura Maximum Security Prison. Lazura is one of the scariest places on the planet. It was built in 1920 for 200 death row inmates. There are over 3,000 men in Lazura today. There are no windows in most places. If you go to Lazura, you go to die. I contacted the warden at Lazare Prison and I gave him my name and said I'd like to see Kabi. I told the warden I was the honorary consul for the Republic of Uganda and after a short pause he said, you're in. Kabi entered the dark room where I was waiting. He had no shoes and was wearing a torn and dirty prison uniform. When he entered he took a knee and told me how bad he felt about what he had done to Charlie. Skeptical, I thought he was just sorry because he had been caught and we punished him. He told me what it was like growing up the son of a witch doctor and and what witchcraft had done to him over the course of his life. Then he said something that stunned me. He said, Bob, I know I'm going to die in here. Think about that. Guy on death row in this maximum security prison talking with this guy, Bob, from California. I know I'm going to die in here. But what I really need is forgiveness. His words hung in the air. Forgiveness? 
For a witch doctor who tried to sacrifice Charlie, this little boy, my immediate reaction was absolutely not. He tried to kill the little boy, but something inside of me had started to change. The, the change hadn't been nearly fast enough, but it was nevertheless happening. I didn't see a killer in front of me. I felt like I was looking at a criminal hanging on a cross next to Jesus. I heard Jesus' words to that criminal, today you will be with me in paradise. There wasn't a quiz Jesus gave to the criminal to get in. He didn't ask the guy about his position on social issues. He didn't ask him to change his behaviors or say a prayer first. He just said, you're in. Standing in a dark room next to a death row is a long way from paradise. Kabi and I went on to talk about what his family was like and what was important to him. I talked about my family, what was important to me. We talked about what I was learning but still didn't have figured out yet about love and grace and forgiveness and Jesus. Then something happened that will forever shape my understanding about what Jesus talked about. Kabi said he wanted to put his faith in life in the strong and kind arms of Jesus. When he did this, you could say he was coming to Christ, as many people would say. But in a way, I was too. Because I was moving away from just agreeing with Jesus to doing what he said when he talked about loving my enemy. What Kabi and I are both learning about love and grace and forgiveness is that none of us needs to fully understand it before we receive it. I've met with Kabi a few times since he began his adventure with Jesus inside the walls of Lazara. When I do see him, I don't see a felon anymore. I see a guy trying to follow Jesus just like I am. While our life experiences and circumstances could not be more different, it turns out many of the problems we have turning into the men we want to be are the same. After one of my meetings with, with Kabi outside of his cell, I asked the warden if anyone had come to talk to the inmates about what Jesus said our lives could look like with him at the center. At first, he waved me off. But then, as if I'd done a Jedi move, he said he'd let Kabi talk to them. A couple of trips later, Kabi and I stood holding hands in the courtyard with my son Richard and a few other friends. I, I listened while Kabi told 3,000 dying men about the new life he had started with Jesus. And I knew what many of them were thinking. Wait, this is, this is the witch doctor, Kabi? The evil guy? Jesus? Him? Unbelievable. Kabi spoke for 30 minutes. Bob writes, honestly, I've never heard anyone hack the gospel message worse than Kabi did that day. His message was garbled and halting, and he barely got anything right. But by the time he was done, every guy in the place knew who Kabi was and what he, would done, what he had done. More than a few knew that I was the guy who had put him there. Our standing in the courtyard together, not as enemies, but as brothers, filled in all the words Kabi had messed up about Jesus. This is the story Jesus came to tell in your life, in my life, in Kabi's life. He said he would turn us into love if we were willing to leave behind who we used to be. When Kabi finished giving the worst, best sermon I've ever heard, hundreds of guys started walking towards us. Kabi picked up a water bottle, as did a couple of other friends. He started baptizing the other prisoners. At first, I was thinking, wait, you can't do that, Kabi. You hardly know anything about your faith. You know almost none of the doctrine, and you're a killer, too. But while I rattled through all the reasons he couldn't, Kabi kept splashing water over the heads of these men, inviting them to, become, to begin the adventure of becoming love themselves. I realized in that moment, Kabi probably knows more about Jesus and forgiveness than most of us. It's a crazy story, right? Just wild transformation, the change, and, and the reconciliation that happened in that life. And the guy from California, a lawyer, a guy in Uganda, come together, talk about this Jesus. And like Bob says, become love themselves. Here's the thing. Kabi experienced the love of God. Through Bob's life, through, through the Holy Spirit, through what Jesus had done, Kabi experienced the love of God expressed in forgiveness 
expressed in grace, in understanding, in compassion. Kabi experienced the Kabi experienced that God wants to reveal his love to each one of us. Kabi experienced that God wants each of us to have, have this revelation that we know that we know, just like the seats we sit on, just like the ground we stand on, that God is for us, that God is concerned about us, that he loves us, that he has this unselfish desire for our good. And God wants to reveal that kind of love to you. But just like Kabi's life, just like the baptism with the water bottle, God wants to release love through you as well. God wants to reveal his love to you. And he wants to release his love through you. He wants to release his love through you. See, God sends Jesus, the Father sends Jesus into this world, and, and Jesus shows us what love is like. But then Jesus invites us to show other people, show those around us what, what love is like and ultimately what he is like. God wants to release his love through you in powerful ways, in big ways, small ways. Mother Teresa said this, and, and a lot of us know who Mother Teresa is. She said this, not all of us can do great things. Not all of us can do great things. Not all of us can be famous. Not all of us can be on TV or on social media and, and do great things. But we all can do small things with great love. We can't all do great things. We can't all be great and be famous, but, but we all can do small things, tangible things, simple things, with great and profound love. And Jesus, Jesus says this, by this, everyone's going to know who I am and that you're my disciples, that you're my followers, that you're my friends, the one who, who I call my own people, if you love one another. By this, everyone will know who you are and who I am if you love one another. Again, it's not, not primarily convinced. It's not primarily, it, it's, it's to love. It's to love. And again, God wants to reveal that kind of love to you. He wants to reveal it in your life. He wants to reveal it in your story. He wants to reveal it through Jesus. He wants to reveal it through his Holy Spirit. And he wants to release that love to those around you, to people in your life, people like Kabi, people like Bob, people like Charles, people in your life that need it. People in your life that need it. People in my life that need it. Receive the love. Experience it being released through us. And that doesn't happen through an argument. It doesn't happen through words. It doesn't happen through a sermon. It doesn't happen through a song. It happens through the Holy Spirit, God's presence making it real for the first time or maybe for the hundredth, thousandth time that God is for you, that he looks on you with concern, that he looks on you with, with love. And he wants to reveal that and, and start the process and the journey of revealing that to you today. And so what we're going to do, our, our team's going to, our team's going to come and we're going to have this moment of just allowing God's spirit, his presence is here to reveal that kind of love. And, and maybe in an ongoing way, or maybe for you, again, it's like, the, it's like the first time it's actually an experience. It's actually, I know that I know that, I, just like the seat I'm sitting on, I know that God is for me. I know that he loves me. Despite what I've heard, despite what maybe I felt in the past, God is for me. Before we do it, I want to just read this passage from the New Testament. 1 John 4, starting in verse 7. This writer writes to, to people he loves, people he calls friends, and he, he writes this about God's love for them. He says, dear friends, let us love one another. Let's release the love of God through us. For love comes from God. It finds its origin in God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us first and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for us. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Just like the psalmist says, God's love, it reaches to the heavens. His faithfulness to the skies. His, his love is unfailing. His love is priceless. 
And our prayer is that he would continue that love, continue revealing and releasing that love in and through our lives today. And what if today could be a day? You could look back on it and say, man, I, I knew that God loved me. I knew that that was the right answer. I knew that that was what I should say. But, but that was a today. Today was a day that, that I experienced it, that I started to walk in it, that I was confident of it. And so before we have this moment and, and just just kind of reflect and maybe experience the love of God. I want to pray for us today. God, we thank you for your love. Thank you, like the passage said, that you are love. That you're this model, that you're, you're really the, what it means to, to be unselfishly concerned and have our highest good in mind. And I thank you again for, for your gift of Jesus. Thank you so much that you love the world so much that you extended, that you gave and you sacrificed your only son. You, you sent your son to us to be loved, to show us what love looks like. So I pray today that people all across this room, people in several locations, would experience your love being revealed to them, would experience your love being made real and evident and tangible to them. And then because of that experience, we'd, we'd experience your, your releasing through us, your love being released in and through our lives. And so we just invite you. We invite you to say, we say, make it real, God. Would you, re, would you reveal it to me today? I'm, I'm open, I'm willing, I'm hungry to experience your love. We, we don't just want information. We don't just want a, a sermon. We don't just want uh, uh, to be convinced or a logical argument. We want an experience with you and your love. So I pray you'd do it today. In Jesus' name.